morning everyone in Kaya. Welcome 2021 Rob Riley Memorial Lecturer and it's wonderful that we can have a face to face this year to last year so that's wonderful. For those who don't know me my name is Professor Marion Kiggett and I am the Director of the Centre for Aboriginal Studies here at Curtin University and I will be your Master of Ceremonies tonight. Firstly I'd wish to acknowledge the Wadjuk Noongar people traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today. And I pay my respects to our ancestors and our elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to warmly extend a warm welcome to Hannah Beasley, who is here tonight with us this evening. Hi Hannah and welcome. I also wish to take a moment to acknowledge uh, those who, who have gone before us and uh, who, who have passed recently. Many, many funerals that we attend and uh, it seems to conti continually happen within our communities. So a few housekeeping uh, matters before we get underway. So to safeguard your health and safety, we encourage you to adhere to the government's physical distancing guidelines and download the Safe WA app. You should have all checked in on arrival or filled out the mandatory contact register that's outside. Please remember to practice good personal hygiene. Hand sanitizer is accessible around the venue and hand washing facilities are available in the toilets. We kindly ask that if you are not feeling well, please let one of the event staff know so they can assist you. May I ask everyone to <coughs> check that your mobile phones are turned off or if you can switch them to silence, please. In the unlikely event of an emergency where we are required to evacuate, please exit the doors you entered to the doors uh, to the back, so the doors that you came through here and over there, or you might be able to get through that one, but definitely one, and there's others up there. So don't all try and knock each other over getting to this one if there is the need to. Hopefully not. So we will make our way, if that is the case, to the car park, and that's uh, car park 11. So please po just follow the directions of events staff and you can't go wrong. Rob Riley. So Rob was a Noongar man. He was our Noongar leader and for many, many of us a great leader. For, for me, one of the things I noticed about Rob, he seemed to be at all the funerals. He, he attended, and it might be brief, but he always turned up and was there. And for me, the last funeral that I saw Rob at was my mother's. So he was there and um, in, in full thought in, in, in showing us you know, his feelings and giving us his, his sincere condolences. And it was just what he did. It's just what he did as a, as a Noongar man. And uh, he certainly lived his culture. So it is my great pleasure now to invite Mr. Anthony Kickett to come up the front here and is our Associate Lecturer at the Centre for Aboriginal Studies to deliver a welcome to country. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Marion, um, for your warm welcome and um, also for sharing that journey with Rob. And Rob, I knew uh, as a young man, I remember Rob coaching us in football when I was 16, 17 year old, only a few years ago, give or take. Um, and and I, in hindsight, I, um, you know, Rob said many great things. But I never—I don't remember any one of them. Um, 
So I just wanted to share that as a as a reflection. Not that I think he just sort of got us together and told us just to go and play footy. So uh, my job is Kaya. Uh, welcome to Nunga uh, Wajak Buja. Um, Nyan Anthony Kikit Nyan uh, Nunga Wajak Marmon. Uh, also having a strong kin and clan connection to Baladong, uh, Ewart and Wunaman peoples within the Noongar Nation. Uh, as Marion has already stated, and, and I, I also wish to, to um, reiterate, you know, I need to say that as our court, our, our heart and our, our word and our spirit is very uh, sad and heavy uh, and tired as we continue to uh, lay our people to rest. Uh, especially our elders, and, and we, we are due to lay a, a beautiful elder to rest next week, and uh, and even news of you know our young people who are taken too soon from us. Um, Professor Megan Davis, as we meet you this evening, and we meet on Nunga Wajak Buja, I would like to say to you, on behalf of my Nunga Nunga old people, my grandmothers and my grandfathers, I'm very pleased and honoured to welcome you to Noongar Wajak Buja this evening and look forward to the presentation. So Kaya Nunukot Waja Wanju Nija Nunga Buja Ngan Jurupan Ngan Kort Jurupan Ngan Nunukot Ni Ni Weir and Kul Karajan Nunga Wangi Nunukot Karajan Wangi Demon Mam Ngak Weir Buria Kora Kora. So welcome to Noongar country. We're happy, our heart is happy to be speaking with you all this evening and to learning about in some aspects of Noongar language but as Noongar people we know that our knowledge is passed down orally through our grandfathers, our grandmothers and our fathers, mothers and Noongar's bosses from long ago. This is our ancestors' land from the dreaming. This is our homeland of history so this evening as we're sitting on Noongar land, my ancestors, my grandmothers, my grandfathers, they're very happy to see you come to this place to sit, listen and think on this place of Noongar Buja. My grandmothers and my grandfathers, they have travelled this land for many thousands of years from the beginning and it's the path of my ancestors that I follow. My ancestors, my grandmothers, my grandfathers, our Mort. Their spirit, their wearin, and their spirit ancestors, they look over you tonight. They protect you like Nyunga while you're sitting on Nyunga, this Nyunga place. And just to talk a little about the Welcome to Country Protocol, it gives traditional owners the opportunity to formally welcome to their land or to their country, their Buja. The ceremony is normally undertaken by elders, acknowledged by, as such by their family and community. The Welcome to Country Protocol is an acknowledgement and recognition of the rights, in this case, of Noongar people, Noongar people. The act of getting a representative who has traditional local links to a particular place, area or region is an acknowledgement of respect for traditional owners. It is respect for people, respect for rights and respect for country. The land, waterways and culturally significant sites are still very important to Noongar people. It is an acknowledgement of the past and provides a safe passage for others, for visitors and guests, and a mark of respect. The traditional country of the Noongar peoples covers the entire southwestern portion of Western Australia. This extends from Lehman in the northwest to beyond Cape Arid in the southeast. Archaeological evidence establishes that the Noongar people have lived in this area and this and had this tract of land on their country for at least 65,000 plus years. Also, Noongar, pe Noongar people are one of the largest Aboriginal cultural blocks in Australia. There is no evidence that there has been any other group than Noongar in the southwest. And as we know, Noongar are made up of 14, up to 14 different language groups, and the spelling may vary. Amangu, Ewood, Wajak, Binjarab, Padandi, Baladong, Nyakinyaki, Wilman, Genang, Bibbulman, Minang, Gorang, Wajiri, and Nyunga. Each of these language groups correlates with different 
geographic areas with ecological distinction. Noongar people speak their own language and have their own laws and customs. These laws and customs are characterised by a strong spiritual connected connection to country or buja, caring for the natural environment and for places of significance, performing ceremonies and rituals, collecting food by hunting, fishing and gathering, providing education and passing on law and customs through stories, art, song and dance. In essence, as traditional owners, we don't own the land, the land owns us. So whilst the effect of European settlement has been profound, many significant aspects of Noongar culture and society have been retained and are still practised by the Noongar people. Kaya Yogamaman, Nach Jirubun Nunuk Jinning, Nach Noongar Wajak Buja, Ngala Yakin, Ngala Jirupun Wamju Nganak, Ngala Noongar Wajak Buja, Nija Ngala Murts Buja Kora Kora, Nija Ngala Kala Buja Kora Wangin, Ngana Ngala Jirupun Murts Ngala Buja. Kura wangin, kela ngala yakin, ngala nyunga nyering, ngala ngala kaya. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. That was really great welcome. It is now my pleasure to welcome to the stage a wonderful choir, Majatul Mourna. <laughs> this choir was co-founded by Joe Randall, Della Ray Morrison <laughs> and Jesse Lloyd in 2006, an initiative of the Kalamunda Zigzag Festival. The choir is currently directed by Della Ray and her son, Kobe Morrison, with approximately 40 members in total. They are into their 15th year and still going strong, and no doubt you'll catch them again throughout NAIDOC week. Please welcome Madhuchul Morna to the stage to sing for us tonight. Uh, this is a song called uh, Court Buja, written by Natasha Eldridge. Um, so we'd like to thank her for um, giving us permission to sing this song. Uh, I was just telling the choir today about, um, you know, growing up with Uncle Rob Riley and um, all the great memories that we have, I have as a child, um, especially Sunday family day and uh, roasts and lots of food and lots of playing cards and lots of darts and lots of laughing, <laughs> lots of laughing. Um, he loved all of us, he loved all his nieces and nephews and his, his daughters and his grandchildren, Jackson and Caitlin. Um, so that's, that's what I've shared with my choir today as I was singing the song so we could connect to the song and connect to this country. and can connect to this great man, Rob Riley, who I very, feel very honoured to have had in my life and who has been a big inspiration um, to me and to everything that you know, I do in my life, I guess. So this is Court Woodjump.
So many thanks to Delaray Morrison for that amazing performance with her, her amazing choir. Uh, something that, that wasn't mentioned in here, and I'd just like to mention, is the, the wonderful work that Delaray Morrison does with, with young um, Noongar children in the country. Um, I know I was visiting home in my country in York and all these amazing children coming out and singing um, and how proud the parents and our community were of them. Um, learning the songs and singing it in Noongar. So, well done on that too, Bella. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Curtin University's Vice-Chancellor, Professor Harleen Hayne, to officially welcome you to tonight's special presentation. Thank you, Professor. Kaya, it is with deep respect that I recognize that we are gathered on the traditional lands of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and I greatly value their traditional knowledge and cultural practices, and I seek to learn and teach with them in partnership here at Curtin. Thank you very much, Marion, for welcoming me to welcome um, our guest speaker tonight. Um, and also thank you, Anthony, for your wonderful welcome to country. Um, I was struck by the comment that you made that Rob said a lot of really important things, but you can't remember what they were. Um, <laughs> The African-American um, poet, the late Maya Angelou, used to say that, in the end, nobody will remember, ever remember what you said, they'll never remember what you did, but they will always remember how you made them feel. So I suspect that for many of the people who are gathered here tonight, um, Rob Riley made you feel many things. He made you feel proud, he made you feel supported, he made you feel loved, and I suspect that that's why you're here this evening. So thank you very much for reminding us of that. I'd like to acknowledge the members of Rob's family who are gathered here with us um, tonight. It is fantastic to have you here. And I'd also like to acknowledge Ms. Hannah Beasley, um, MLA, the member of Victoria Park. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know that this is a very important occasion for you, um, and we're very happy to have you here. On behalf of, um, behalf of Curtin and uh, the Center for Aboriginal Studies, I'm very honored to welcome everyone to the 2021 Rob Riley Lecture. Since 2004, this particular lecture has been an incredibly important event on the Curtin calendar. Although I never had the privilege of meeting Rob, I am very well aware of his powerful legacy a legacy that is not forgotten here at Curtin. Rob worked tirelessly to advance social justice and reconciliation with non-Indigenous Australia. He was the chairperson of the National Aboriginal Council, part of the negotiating team on the Native Title Act, senior advisor to the Federal Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, and head of the Aboriginal Issues Unit of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Rob was also pivotal, pivotal in establishing the Perth Aboriginal Medical Service, the Aboriginal Child Care Agency, the WA Aboriginal Media Association, and the Center for Aboriginal Studies here at Curtin. In recognition of his remarkable achievements, he was awarded the Human Rights Medal in 1996. Sadly, despite his many achievements, Rob Riley's sense of betrayal by the Australian political system in their failure to deliver justice to Aboriginal people was at some times overwhelming, even for this incredibly powerful Noongar leader. His untimely death is mourned by all of Australia. Now, as some of you know, I am a recent arrival to WA, having only crossed the ditch from New Zealand not even two months ago. Now, you may have noticed from my accent that I am originally from the United States, but I have spent the last 29 plus years living um, in New Zealand, leading the University of Otago, and as the last, in the last 10 years, I was their Vice Chancellor. Since arriving in Perth, I have been absolutely overwhelmed by the generosity of the Noongar community 
who have openly welcomed me and shared their stories with me. This same kind of generosity is reflected in the Uluru Statement from the Heart through an eloquent invitation to all Australians to walk together with our First Nations people in a movement for a better future for all of us through voice, treaty, and truth. Now in New Zealand, where I have come from, Māori electorates were introduced in 1867 to ensure that the Māori voice was represented in Parliament and they remain and increase in number each year. As a New Zealander, it seems almost incomprehensible to me that 181 years since the Treaty of Waitangi was signed, Australia remains the only Commonwealth country to never have signed a treaty with its First Nations people. The Waitangi Tribunal, established in 1975, is considered by some as the longest surviving truth and reconciliation project in the world. While these measures are not perfect, they have provided a permanent platform for advancing justice and self-determination for the First Nations people of Aotearoa. So I'm very proud to now be here at Curtin, an Elevate RAP organization that fully supports the Uluru Statement for a call for a referendum to enshrine the voice of Aboriginal people in our Constitution. It is well and truly time. Now, as the title of tonight's lecture suggests, some of the most urgent policy areas crying out for the inclusion of an Aboriginal voice is in child removal and youth detention. Although Australians are currently trying to come to grips with the horrors of a stolen generation, it's important for all of us to recognize that similar injustices continue today. It's encouraging to me to see that alongside the Children and Community Services Amendment Bill 2021 that was introduced in the WA Parliament recently, that there were also pilots for Aboriginal family-led decision-making, a decision-making process that is recognized by Aboriginal people as best practice. This practice has already been adopted in Victoria, New South Wales, and Queensland. And I'm hopeful that the pilots that are being conducted here in WA will soon lead to the adoption in law of family-made decision-making in WA. Senator Pat Dobson once said of Rob Riley, he had the vision when others were still searching in the darkness. He had courage to walk without trepidation while others had difficulty finding the strength to confront the barriers that were raised before us. 25 years later, there are other leaders who have taken up the baton from Rob Riley. These new leaders need the same courage and resilience to confront the challenges that they face, no more so than our guest speaker for tonight's lecture, Professor Megan Davis. As you will all be aware, Professor Davis walked the depth and breadth of this nation, consulting with our First Nations people, and she has helped facilitate the extraordinary consensus resulting in the profound Uluru Statement from the Heart. It was she who first shared those powerful words directly with the nation. And it was she who, with extraordinary resilience, has continued to seek support for the Uluru Statement's call for a constitutionally enshrined First Nations voice to Parliament and a Makarata com Commission to supervise a process of agreement making and truth telling. Voice, treaty, and truth. In recognition of this unwavering commitment on National Sorry Day, the 25th of May, Professor Davis, Pat Anderson AO, and Noel Pearson accepted the Sydney Peace Award on behalf of all of those who worked on the Uluru Statement from the Heart for bringing together Australia's First Nations peoples around a clear and comprehensive agenda for healing and peace within our nation. Professor Megan Davis is a Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous and Professor of Law at UNSW. And she is a renowned constitutional lawyer, scholar, and public law expert. 
She is a Kabul Kabul woman from the Barangum Nation in southwest Queensland. Professor Davis is acting commissioner of the NSW Land and Environment Court and was recently appointed to the Balneves Chair in Constitutional Law. Professor Davis was also a member of the Referendum Council and the expert panel on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution. She was the first Aboriginal Australian to be elected to a United Nations body, and she is the former chair and expert member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples in New York from 2011 to 2016. She currently serves as a member of the United Nations Human Rights Council's expert mechanism on the rights of Indigenous peoples. It is my great honor and my privilege to ask all of you who are here this evening to join me in welcoming Professor Megan Davis. Thank you for that very um, kind introduction. Um, and Marianne, thank you for your kind words as well. It's an honour to be here tonight um, on the land of the Wajak peoples of the Noongar Nation for the Rob Riley Memorial Lecture. Um, it's with a deep sense of respect uh, for the Wajak people and the broader Noongar Nation that I speak today in tribute um, of the great Rob Riley. Thank you, Anthony, for your welcome to country. Um, as a Cobble Cobble woman from the Barragum Nation on the other side of the continent, um, I acknowledge you and all the Wajak people and your elders past and present. Um, Rob's family, who I haven't met yet, um, is that, hi, <laughs> where are they? Hi, sorry. How, how are you? It's nice to meet you. Thank you for giving me the honour of speaking tonight. Um, this is a responsibility that I do not take lightly, and it's really truly an honour. I was just sharing some words with Anthony about the fact that I worked as a junior lawyer 25 years ago at FARA, um, the Foundation for Aboriginal Islander Research Action in Brisbane, um, which was run by Les Malzer at the time who knew Rob well, and a lot of the old activists used to come to Fair and talk about uh, Rob and the work that he'd, he'd done, or he had done. And um, he um, is one of those people who have had a profound influence, I suppose, on my thinking as a lawyer and my development um, as a lawyer, um, and particularly around law reform. And uh, last week I had the great honour to deliver the um, Eddie Marbo oration. And I see Eddie Marbo and Rob Riley as those two great pillars of law reform um, and Aboriginal activism uh, in, in this country. So I said to Anthony, I've been waiting decades to be invited to give this talk. So <laughs> I was like, yay, finally. <laughs> So I'm really, really, really stoked to be here, and there's, I could, I've seen a lot of friends in the room tonight. Um, the Uluru Statement from the Heart was awarded the Sydney Peace Prize, as Arnie Pat Anderson said, the first inanimate object in the history of the prize to receive an award, but um, I acknowledge many participants in the um, Perth Dialogue in the room, the Broom Dialogue in the room, um, and the Sydney Peace Prize is a testament to your, to your work and participation in, in that dialogue process and for those who attended the national meeting. Um, but the national meeting really just endorsed what was decided in the dialogues. So I take my hat off to all of you. Today I'm going to speak um, to the crisis um, that we as Aboriginal people still face in terms of structural powerlessness um, and the manifestation of that in terms of child removals and, and youth detention. And so I want to talk to it in the context or insofar as this constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament um, as called for in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which we say must be enshrined. We need a referendum to protect that in the constitution. 
And we say that the legislative model that Minister Ken White is settling for will not animate the kind of power that is required to make a difference in our children's lives. And I should say that Uluru's statement from the heart travels nowhere anymore. Um, it, it used to, but it hasn't really been out for two and a bit years. So um, we felt it was really important to bring it here in recognition of Rob, Rob Riley, but also the very important history of activism um, of the Noongar people over here. So um, today I'm going to do a few things. I've never really spoken about the work that I've done in terms of um, two things that I did right across the top of my constitutional work, and that is a commission of inquiry for the Queensland State Government into youth detention centres and my two-year inquiry in New South Wales into Aboriginal out-of-home care. Um, both of those pieces of work have really influenced my thinking around constitutional reform and the importance of constitutional power um, and arresting the rates of our young people entering youth detention and out-of-home care. So I want to start by just giving a brief overview of where we are in terms of the Uluru Statement from the Heart and then move on to um, a little bit more substance around what's going on at the moment, um, particularly in child protection and child removals. 2021 marks the second decade of constitutional recognition in Australia. It commenced really in 2010 when Julia Gillard set up a expert panel on the recognition of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Australian Constitution. She created that expert panel um, at the urging of the Greens and the independents, Rob Oakeshott and Tony Windsor. And who would know that a decade later, following seven processes and nine reports, that the nation would still be waiting for the Commonwealth to act? Constitutional recognition is a, is a common form of legal recognition in liberal democracies with Indigenous populations. So although it's been conflated in some quarters as being um, uh, equivalent to symbolism, it's not. Recognition can be many things. Recognition can be symbolic recognition. It can. But it can also mean a treaty or treaty agreements. It can also mean autonomous arrangements uh, like Nunavut. It can mean reserved seats. Um, as they have in um, Aotearoa, um, it can mean many things. It can mean constitutional rights. So it's a very common way in which liberal democracies find a way that Indigenous peoples can participate in the democratic life of, of a state. And there is a little bit of trickiness in Australia about the sequencing of that, because in most countries, Treaty came first, recognition after. Recognition is something that is not born of race, but it is born of culture. It is a nation-building exercise that seeks to include First Nations within the framework of the state to ensure that despite the vulnerability of their numbers and their unique issues, particularly insofar as land, that they have that formal legal recognition by the state. Most countries entered into peace treaties at the point of dispossession. This creates a form of legitimacy in public law for Indigenous peoples. That means their existence and their claims on the state are taken seriously by the state, particularly if a manifestation of that peace treaty is recognition of sovereignty or of constitutional rights. Australia did not enter into any peace treaties. And because of that, this recognition has been an ongoing pursuit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Over the course of this recognition decade, the most recent iteration of an attempt at structural reform in this country, the Commonwealth has asked First Nations, what is meaningful recognition to you in your region? And the response following serious deliberation was the Uluru Statement from the Heart voice, treaty and truth, a constitutionally enshrined voice, a Makarata Commission to supervise agreement making and truth telling across the Federation. 
The Uluru Statement from the Heart is the legal and political statement that many First Nations committed to in 2017. And they also committed to engaging the Australian people to walk with us, as they did in 1967, to compel politicians to act and to not be afraid of change. And this is the primary problem that we have in, in Canberra, is politicians' fear of losing the referendum and politicians' fear of the Australian people. So where are we since the issuing of the Uluru Statement from the Heart? Following the issuing of the statement, we of course had a couple of months later a rejection by the Prime Minister at the time, Malcolm Turnbull. But not long after his rejection of the Uluru Statement, the statement was put into a joint parliamentary committee. And that joint parliamentary committee did its work over 2018, chaired by Patrick Dodson and Julian Lisa. And they recommended that before you could go to a referendum, you needed more meat on the bones of what a voice looked like. They said Australians wouldn't vote yes at a referendum if they didn't know what the voice looked like. And they recommended a co-design process first, and then after it's designed, they would decide what the form of the voice would be. Following this, the Morrison government committed in the budget of 20,000, oh, sorry, 20,000, the Morrison government committed in 2019 in the budget, $7 million to a co-design process and $160 million to run a voice referendum. That $160 million still sits in the contingency reserve. This budget commitment at the beginning of 2019 before the election was followed by an election platform that included in it for the LNP a commitment to co-design the voice and decide the timing of the referendum after. In addition to that, the ALP committed to a referendum in its first term um, on a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament. So following the election, the um, voice co-design was eventually uh, set up by Minister Ke Ken Wyatt. And that's really, I suppose, where we are in the process with an interim report having been handed to the public in January this year and a public submissions process and consultation process having occurred um, over the past few months. One of the problems we've come up against with this process, though, is that after the election, um, Minister Wyatt said that he would only support a legislative voice to parliament, not a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament. The Indigenous Law Centre at the University of New South Wales has conducted a qualitative and quantitative analysis of the public submissions to the voice uh, interim process and the consultations held around the country. Of the submissions, over 3,000 submissions to this inquiry, 90% of the submissions support a referendum. 90% of the submissions are asking the Australian government to take the Australian people to a referendum on a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament. So what we know after four years is that momentum is building. Uh, we know that as of last week, the New South Wales Premier has supported uh, a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament and Today, Anastasia Palaszczuk in Queensland has said the same. And we know that in Australia we need a majority of states uh, and a national majority for a successful referendum. So despite Turnbull's initial rejection, which we say spoke to the torment of his own powerlessness, <laughs> Uluru is still on the table and it is capable of winning acceptance in a referendum but it has been four years. And in my title tonight, I invoked that word exigency, which effectively means urgency. And there's nothing more urgent than the lives of our young people now. The Uluru Statement from the Heart When You Read It is a First Nations articulation of the exigency of the national reform, 
We, we wrote that statement to explain to Australians the logic of the three reforms. But it does identify two public policy areas, primarily the responsibility of the states, as underpinning the logic of the Commonwealth's structural reforms, child removals and youth detention. The Uluru Statement reads, Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not innately criminal people. Our children are aliened from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. In 2016, as we were designing and preparing to roll out the constitutional dialogues, I was um, a co-commissioner alongside Catherine McMillan QC on a Queensland statutory inquiry, a, a royal commission at a state level, uh, under the Commissions of Inquiry Act in Queensland into the treatment of children and young people in Queensland's youth detention centres. And many of the cases that we had to investigate were Aboriginal young men and Torres Strait Islander girls. At the same time, I was sounded out by the Minister in New South Wales to lead an inquiry into Aboriginal out-of-home care and why the rates in New South Wales are so high. These two inquiries coming in and around the same time as the work of my constitutional work um, had a huge impact upon the direction of uh, the Uluru Statement and the work that we've done on the design of the voice. And that's what I want to talk about for the remainder of the lecture. Of course, one of the first things that strikes you when you're looking in a parallel sense at out-of-home care and youth detention is the very clear link, the very clear link between child protection and youth detention. And that was evidenced in the New South Wales uh, inquiry that I led called Family as Culture, where a very large proportion of young people are channeled from out-of-home care into youth detention. As a regulatory theorist and a, and a UN expert who specialises in Indigenous people's rights, the rights of our children and young people concern me greatly in this country, as they do all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But if you look to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Child, the reports that Australia makes to that committee, we fare really poorly when it comes to the treatment of children. We're actually one of the worst in terms of Western liberal democracies and the, and the treatment of little people, young people, children. Those reports are well worth downloading to just see just how poorly we do fare as a nation because I think it definitely runs um, counter to what the national narrative may be. But these two independent reviews uh, really gave me valuable, invaluable insight into regulatory systems and how they function to disempower Aboriginal people. And in that work, I could see the benefit of the voice as a mechanism to provide accountability. Accountability to those professionals who are meant to help our families and don't. To provide accountability to those people who are meant to be a voice for our families and aren't. Bureaucracy is a very large beast that we know from the research takes on a life of its own, with its own practices, norms and cultures. And really to understand the way in which youth detention and the way in which child protection um, subjugates our people, you need to understand the way in which regulatory systems work. So bureaucracies are basically the front line of regulatory systems. And the culture of departments usually dictate whether or not the intent of parliament is pro properly implemented. And often the culture of departments can be indifferent or resistant to the intentions of legislators. And this means that the regulatory framework, the laws and policies that govern a bureaucracy, often compete with 
or are neutralised by the dominant culture of a department. Mostly, and this is certainly the case with Aboriginal caseworkers, employees have no choice but to adopt or conform to that dominant culture of the workplace or the department. And as a caseworker, if the workplace culture is about risk aversion, and many, and many are, then one is likely to minimise those innate skills as a social worker, as a caseworker, that invite risk, such as intuition and instinct. And also, I have to include institutional racism in that. But the thinking doesn't... The thinking is about court. The thinking is about judges and lawyers and risk. The thinking is not about care. In, in, in my review, we read 1,142 children's files and, and departments, caseworkers, do really stupid things, really stupid things, because they're not thinking about intuition and instinct. They're just thinking about getting a rap over the knuckles by the department's lawyers. As I said, whatever the values of a department or caseworker is, they, they almost all conform to the dominant culture. And one of the ways in which workers conform is through adopting what we call the comfort of rituals or ritualism. And ritualism is a really useful lens to understand the decision-making culture of bureaucracy as it relates to Aboriginal children and young people in both youth justice and in child protection. And ritualism is never more valid than when it comes to the implementation of the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle. The Aboriginal Child Placement Principle, at least in New South Wales, was recognised in the, the Primary Child Protection Statute by our democratically elected legislators in New South Wales as a commitment to keeping Aboriginal children with their family. Yet it is poorly implemented and utterly misunderstood. And part of that in our review we found, and we write quite a substantial part in the report on this, is the failure of caseworkers and departments to understand Aboriginal history. This is where the truth-telling part comes into it. The numbers of caseworkers that I interviewed that didn't understand that towns um, where there was high numbers of removals were, were ex-reserves and missions. You had caseworkers and social workers that didn't know about the protection era. I mean, it's astounding that they could be working in that space or with Aboriginal children and not having really fundamental knowledge about Aboriginal history. So one of the things the inquiry really shone a, shone a light on for me was the role that Australian history plays, what we need to be teaching kids in primary school and high school, because you can't be a professional in this space if you don't know about the history of protection acts in this country. So the commitment, the language, the implementation of the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle is replete with ritualism. Ritualism takes uh, the form of compliance manifest in many things, right? So endlessly changing policies, espousing departmental commitment to the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle. Just during my two-year inquiry, they must have changed 30 or 40 policies on the run all with fabulous brochures and posters with smiling Aboriginal kids and dot paintings and snakes. And this is what the ritualism is. Um, endless meetings with bureaucrats where the minutes, the accuracy of minutes, are more important than the substance. And as I said, glossy brochures, ticker box forms, the bureaucracies in this space are just replete with these examples of faux compliance. Because despite this, the outward appearance of compliance, which is a kind of formal participation in a system of regulation, the outward appearance of compliance shields a culture of non-compliance. In the New South Wales review that I led, um, and the children and young people that were involved, we found that the department had completely lost its focus when it came to the fundamental goal of the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle, and that is keeping children and young people connected to family, connected to community, connected to culture and country, 
and recognising community as a strength for those young people and those children. And that's because, as I said, the culture of compliance overwhelms the other critical skills and faculties that casework demands, right? Intuition, instinct and judgement. That just goes out the window. So in, in our family is culture review. It um, went for 2017, 2018. We handed down the report in 2019. It was important for several, several reasons. It was the only review established in New South Wales to focus specifically on Aboriginal children in the child protection system in New South Wales. So too often states and territories will initiate a child protection review and our children's issues are just swamped with the bigger, broader system. It's also the only review in New South Wales to be granted total access to departmental case files. So we examined the files, as I said, of 1,144 Aboriginal children and young people. It was a huge task, which is why we couldn't get it done within a year. We read every single file. Um, and finally, it's the first review that was led by um, an Aboriginal chairperson. And I was supported by an Aboriginal reference group. So there are a few things that I want to talk to that came out of that review that's relevant to the topic of the lecture about a constitutional voice. The first thing was really the key structural problems that we found with child protection was to do with self-determination and secondly, accountability. And these are two really key areas in which the voice can play a really key role if it's implemented in the way that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples ask for in the Uluru Dialogues. So in terms of self-determination, we have you know, generally a really serious problem at a state and territory level on child protection, simply because at the Commonwealth level, there is no self-determination policy. Um, and as I said, this is where a voice will play a role. Self-determination is really hard to do or implement or talk about at a state and territory level if, com if the Commonwealth is not at the table. And I hear people talk about treaty frameworks today a lot of talk about Queensland Treaty and a possible child protection system within that treaty framework. But those autonomous child protection systems are very unlikely in Australia's federation because of the way Australia's federation is structured. The Commonwealth, we're not like Canada, for example. The Commonwealth trumps all in Australia. In Canada, the provinces have retained their power. In Australia, the states haven't. And that, that goes for treaty at a state level. The Commonwealth has, and territory level, section 122, and the states override in 5126. They've got multiple levers in which to disallow or overturn any element of a treaty, because that is the power of the Commonwealth. So self-determination is a really key right for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And it's used frequently and routinely in the child protection space. And it's ill-defined at a state, territory and Commonwealth level. And because of that, it's being conflated with consultation and participation. But, but that is not what the right to self-determination is. And at a New South Wales level, they refer to it as the principle of self-determination. And there's many um, Aboriginal organisations from around the country who made submissions to the Wired Interim Voice who refer to it as a principle of self-determination. It's not a principle of self-determination. That is the state diminishing the power of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and Aboriginal Peoples' right to self-determination. It's not a principle. It's a right in public international law. It is a right to self-determination and it is a collective right. So it shouldn't be con conflated with consultation and it shouldn't be conflated with participation. The other issue I just referred to was the issue of accountability and that's what I'm going to spend a little bit more time on. Because one of the things that we don't talk about in Australia is that the child protection system really, in New South Wales and in most jurisdictions, just lack appropriate 
accountability and oversight. In fact, the poor accountability of caseworkers, it's worse than the police. Yeah, there's very little consequences for poor social work practice. So I just wanted to talk to accountability in the context of the three levers of change that we looked at in our report. The first lever of change being changing the entry into care. So that, that's the key thing that we need to focus, right, is to stop young people and children going into care at all. So we made a lot of recommendations around funding and design and implementation of early intervention services. And one of the first things the minister had said to me was, look, whatever you do, just don't make a recommendation on, on more resources at the front end of the system, right? Because we know that governments don't want to hear that. They don't want to fund more housing. You know, they don't want to fund more services because they're not vote winners. But that's the only way to stop our young people and children from going into care. So we did make a number of recommendations around legislation being amended to recognise the harm of removal in, in order to highlight that Aboriginal children removed from their families may suffer abuse in care, along with a myriad of other harms associated with growing up in out-of-home care. And that includes poor mental health, poor educational uh, outcomes, substance abuse, homelessness, and care criminalisation. And I've already referred to care criminalisation, but we know that there's a very well-established link in Australia between out-of-home care and the criminal justice system. And the most recent kind of data that came out after our review um, by the Australian Institute of Health and uh, Welfare um, noted that 26% of young people in youth detention had been in out-of-home care um, in the five years from 2014 to 2019. So that, that link is very real. Care criminalisation is very real. The second part that was, I think, quite insidious that we came across in our report was prenatal reporting and newborn removals. It was such a problem in New South Wales that we made, we devoted a whole chapter to this. And the data that we had access to revealed that one third of prenatal reports in 2016, 17 related to Aboriginal children. Um, and in almost one quarter of cases, Aboriginal children were assumed into care at birth or from the hospital in the period after their birth. So this combined with the fact that the case files showed multiple instances of poor uh, and unethical newborn removal practices, um, we concluded that the operation of prenatal reporting required urgent reform. The impact of newborn removals on Aboriginal families and communities is, is truly devastating and it contributes to a persistent and ongoing cycle of trauma and successive child removals. I'm just gonna read three examples from, from our inquiry about prenatal removals. In case 37, the child was assumed into care at 4 a.m. immediately after the birth, despite the fact that case workers had told the parents that they would be supported to attend rehabilitation under a safety plan. In case 99, despite there being nine prenatal reports, a caseworker was only assigned after the birth of the child. The child was assumed into care from the hospital despite the child's grandmother informing the department that there were family members who were willing and able to care for the child. And I have to say the most heartbreaking part of the review is reading the numbers of files in which family, Aboriginal family have rung the department and said, I can care for that child, and the caseworker has never returned the call. And they've never followed up. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children. The high level of prenatal reports and newborn removals combined with, um, oh, sorry, I made that point, um, combined with the evidence about this newborn removals in practice led us to make really serious um, urgent reforms, recommendations for reforms, which actually the department, um, it was one of the first areas they did seek to move on in terms of implementation of our recommendations. 
But in terms of what our people say about a second stolen generation, it is the statistics around prenatal removals that are the most shocking. So the first lever is entry into care. How do you stop our young people and children from going into care? The second lever being the implementation of the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle. And I've already kind of referred to that in that even though it might be recognised in statute, there's a whole regulatory ritualism around ACPP. It's just not simply implemented. And one of the findings in our kind of many interviews with caseworkers is that they don't understand the concept of country. They don't understand Aboriginal culture and they don't understand why the children need to stay in and around family. But the point I made just before about the files where people have rung up to say, I can care for family. That accountability issue, insofar as caseworkers, um, is that we looked across professions across Australia and the kind of accountab accountability mechanisms that are in place from professional societies that say when you make poor practice or a really bad decision, you're either out of the profession or you're, you're pulled out and you've got to be retrained or you're demoted or you lose income or you're fired, doesn't happen in this space. At least it doesn't happen in New South Wales. There are no consequences for poor practice. And when you look at the same caseworkers with some of the most, the worst files that we've ever seen, they are moved around the state and promoted. So I know we talk about police conduct and the Royal Commission, but this sector, there's less, there's virtually no accountability in that space. And the mechanisms set up to assist, like child commissioners and ombudsmen and all the kind of wonderful mechanisms that the state comes up with as a way of providing some sort of oversight and accountability, they simply don't work. What we found in our inquiry is they all talk to each other and they're all feeding each other and they're all calculating what this piece of work will mean for their budgets. So, so we're just wrapped up in this um, regulatory nightmare. So I just wanted to finish off on the third lever um, in terms of child uh, removals, and that is exits from care. So how do you get children and young people safely out the other side, back to their parents or back to their family? So we made a lot of recommendations here, but the, the, I suppose the most difficult one here was examining restoration um, recommendations in case files. And in, in, in a large number of case files where restoration should have been recommended, it wasn't recommended in the care plan. And um, we looked at all of the, in these files, the barriers to restoration, and one of them is just impossible goal setting. Parents simply cannot make the goal that the department has set out for them. In case 37, the department sent a number of goals for the parents including requiring them to attend a rehabilitation centre for at least one month. One practical barrier was that the child's mother was concerned she would lose her home if she went to a rehabilitation centre and nobody helped her. In case 350, the department required Jay's parents to achieve a number of restoration goals, including to attend anger management course, violence counselling and to cease violence against Jay. Initially, Jay's parents worked with the department. However, they withdrew on the basis that the department was not willing to work with them outside of the hours of their full-time jobs. And they were concerned that they would lose their employment. And no one helped that family. In case 360, the child's father was required to complete urine testing three times a week for eight weeks, and then randomly as requested by the department to secure stable accommodation and stay in the accommodation for a minimum of 12 months to be free from rent arrears, police involvement, intelligence, complaints and tenancy tribunal proceedings and undergo a parenting capacity assessment. There was absolutely no information or documentation on that file to suggest that the child's father was a drug user or that his accommodation with family members was unstable. There was just simply no evidence, but it was still a restoration goal. 
The restoration goals are just of, you know, um, Sisyphean proportion. It's simply not possible for these parents to achieve those. So the last one I want to end on is the lying to the court and the rule of law. This is not, New South Wales is not the only place this happens. It happens in Queensland and other jurisdictions. But what we found, similar to the Carmody Inquiry, is that despite um, the existence of large numbers of policy doc documents and codes of conduct and legislative instruments and training materials dealing with the standard of evidence to be supplied to the Children's Court, there were significant issues with the provision of evidence and care and protections proceedings. So the case files revealed that the evidence presented to the judge in the Children's Court was often factually incorrect, um, not placed in its correct context, or was overstated or exaggerated. So in case 14, the department informed the court that it had referred the child's parent to drug and alcohol counsellors. No referral had taken place. In case 81, the department informed the court that it was concerned about the transience of the child's mother and the child's exposure to domestic violence. However, the mother had been in stable accommodation provided by the Department of Housing for three years and she was not in a violent relationship. That's just fabricated evidence. It's made up. In case 230, the department informed the court that there was no parent available to care for the child when in fact the child's father was available to care for him. And that child gets whisked away into out of home care. In case 16, the department informed the court that Bernardos refused to work with the child's father when in fact Bernardos had closed its file with the family because there were no ongoing child protection issues. So the provision of false or misleading evidence to the children's court, we recommended what Queensland did, and that was to separate this work out. Don't let facts or docs lawyers be the lawyers um, that prepare the material for court. You've got to separate it out. So in Queensland, they've separated it out from the Department of Ch Child Safety, and then all of the information and files go to Attorney Generals and the AG's lawyers check all of the evidence. And if the evidence is not there, they send it back to the department and ask for the evidence so that this can't happen. And it happens a lot, right? In a country where we espouse the rule of law, we have lawyers lying to the court about the way our parents are treating their children. I won't go on. I was going to talk a bit about the decision-making, structured decision-making tools and other things. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make is that we are told so often in this country that we are, we are to blame. Our, our families are to blame. Our parents are to blame. Our children are to blame. You know, we're told that the risk tools are okay. We're told that the structured decision-making tools are okay. But, but the reality is, and, 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 and we always issue a caveat saying we know that poverty exists in our community and we know that poor decision-making alcoholism, drugs, we know these things exist in our communities. But the narrative in broader Australia, in wider Australia, is that we have a problem with parenting, that we have a problem with raising our children. When in fact, what my review has shown, what the Carmody Review has shown, what many reviews have shown, is it's a structural problem. Their systems are the problem. Accountability is a problem. You, you think about that boy who's, who's, who, who can't see his father, was mo removed from his family. There's no accountability for that decision by that caseworker and by those lawyers. There should be accountability, but there's not. And I think that that's the role that a voice that has constitutional power can play across the Federation when it comes to accountability. We talk about this in the Uluru Statement, right? It, the, the torment of our powerlessness is our structural powerlessness. And that's a really important thing about the enshrined voice to parliament. Not a legislative voice to parliament. We didn't do the Uluru constitutional dialogues. We didn't go to the rock and ask for a legislated voice. We're asking for a constitutionally enshrined voice. And, and why? Partly the force of law. Partly because we had those conversations about strong law and the highest law that the white man has is their constitution. 
If you want to do, if you want the government to do something or to stop them doing something, you put it in the constitution. That is their highest law. The constitution, not legislation. What we're saying is you have to have us at the table. And yes, there's a lot of debate in the community about it not being binding, but you need to compel them to have us at the table for every single conversation that they have about our people's lives and our people's rights. And because the Constitution trumps all, this, this norm of consultation will permeate states and territories in terms of practice. And in fact, for a number of years post Uluru, there have been departments, governments, corporations, royal societies talking to us about how they prepare their constitution to provide Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with a voice at the table. And we're not talking advisory. It's, it's a constitutional body. It has power because Australians voted yes at a ballot box. That gives it its power. So there are so many things to say about where a properly um, accountable and transparent and well-resourced system could aid our people's lives. But the biggest, in my view, having done this work in youth detention and, and child protection, the biggest part is, is forcing the changes and holding them to account. And one of the most powerful things I think that the dialogues did was to drive this point home that these problems and issues are known intimately by individuals and families on the ground. Yeah, they're known intimately by communities. And there is no way to, there's no avenue right now to channel that to the Commonwealth Parliament. There is no way that you can be listened to and there's so many examples of the ways in which grassroots insight into policy impact is so crucial to having better policy and better laws. And really that's at the core, I think, of a constitutionally enshrined voice, is that right now we're not at the table. Yes, yeah? so the policies and laws are of very poor quality. They're not hitting the ground. They're not doing the things they need to be because you don't have that grassroots insight channeling in to the policy and the laws. And that's, that's what a voice does. It compels the state to have us at the table, like forces them. We know that they're not gonna do that out of the goodness of their heart, right? So that's the legislated voice. Yeah, build it and, and hope that maybe they'll have us at the table. No, 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 we want a constitutional right to be at the table. They're, they are apples and oranges, they are two different things. I'm going to skip over um, a lot of this and get to my conclusion. One of the most deeply worrying things going on at a Commonwealth level is, is the Commonwealth's disavowal of 1967. And you hear them saying it all the time now, you know, we're just the ATM, have you heard that? They, they all say it, we're just the ATM. And they say now that you, know, you don't need a voice to parliament, it's not really that important because the states and territories have responsibility for indigenous peoples. Yeah, so that's, that's pre-67 talk. And there's a really fantastic caper paper by Mike Dillon, who used to lead that department in PMNC, saying this is deeply worrying. They are walking back on 67. Australians and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people voted to say that the Commonwealth has primary responsibility for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in that referendum, and they are walking it back. It is their responsibility. They have a lot of international obligations that say juvenile justice is their responsibility. The same with child protection. It is their responsibility. Yes, they are the ATM, but they are also all powerful and they can use levers to get states and territories to do things. And I think back to the implementation of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custody recommendations. The Ajax were abolished and the Commonwealth dropped the ball, right? 
the, the, the Ajax started to be abolished after the Commonwealth dropped the ball on monitoring Rikidik. That's what the Commonwealth did. And a voice can hold them to account. A voice can get these recommendations from my review, you know, from the Royal Commission in the Northern Territory, from the commissions of inquiry into the recognition of Aboriginal customary law. There are so many reports and recommendations about our people's lives that we need to be holding them to account for. So the voice is very much, it's not about wishy-washy guidelines. It's not about wishy-washy policy. It's about real power. It's not about soft law, it's about hard law. It, it has teeth, it has the force of law. And that, that is what we're asking for. That is what the Uluru Statement from the Heart is asking for. And it's really not that beaver deal. Yeah, if I put my UN hat on, 194 UN member states, there's probably 70 that have substantive voices like this, right? Ways in which you enhance participation of Indigenous peoples in the democratic life of the state. It's really not a big ask. So just to conclude, um, I, I'd written here that, you know, I'd heard all about Rob Riley during law school, Les Malzer and others in the East talking about Rob in the West. He's so significant to our people since first contact that he's, he's actually named in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is 18 pages. It is the Uluru Statement from the Heart and then there is our story, which is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander story of Australia. And under the heading of activism, so it goes through all the phases, goes through the invasion, goes through the killing times, goes through the protection era, the mourning era, goes through activism. And at the end of activism, they talk about Rob Riley in the West. That's how significant he is to our people. As I said at the beginning, two people influenced my journey as a lawyer and law reform, Eddie Marbo and Rob Riley. Speaking in tribute of the life and legacy of Rob Riley is a daunting task. As Laura knows, I've never been so nervous in my life. His is a life marked by, sorry, that's my ear at the front. She's like, why did you name me? <laughs> His is a life that is marked by an unrelenting and profound quest for justice a leader who fought for Aboriginal rights from here in the West on Noongar country all the way to the halls of Canberra. His legacy can be seen across the nation. It is a legacy whose impact can be felt by all Aboriginal people still today. Rob's work, activism and political achievements have made an indelible mark on this country, whether it is regarding national land rights, treaty, deaths in custody, self-determination, the justice system or stolen generations, Rob had a role in pushing for change. And like many Aboriginal people, his quest for justice was grounded in his own experiences of removal, institutionalisation, institutionalism, sorry, segregation and racism. A reality that is fuelled further by his own understanding of how the state attempts to systematically re render our people voiceless and powerless when the status quo is challenged. Rob Stro spoke truth to power, then he spent his life trying to change how that power worked so that all Aboriginal people had rights and a voice in their own country. His life shows plainly that the impacts of colonialism are not footnotes in a history book, but are lived through the generations and represent a, mo a very modern reality. But his life also shows the power and the strength of our people, a determination to ensure that future generations do not need to take up the same fight. Today, all these years later, after Rob's death, his quest for justice continues. It is still a reality today that our families stay awake at night, scared that their children will be taken from them. And they are disproportionately taken. And our young people are locked up at obscene rates. This shows no sign of abating. And despite it all, we still lack a voice in our own land. As written in the Uluru Statement, 
Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Davis. What a, a powerful, a powerful presentation tonight, and uh, so much for all of us to think about. And um, I think for me personally, education is the key. Um, Dad, not us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would like to invite our, our vice chancellor to come up and um, present you with a gift for coming over here to the west, coming across the Nullarbor. Um, it's a long way to come. It was a long way. <laughs> I know. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, again, please join me in thanking We now invite you to please join us. This brings it to a conclusion. Uh, we'd like you to come to the John Curtin Gallery uh, for some light refreshments. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be lots to discuss. So thank you.